special meals to, believe it or not, Viagra at the age of 75. And yeah, I don't want to know what they wanted to use that for. Uh, but the judge was saying the same thing. Why should this guy, you know, grumbling? I don't want to deal with them. And I said, you know what, judge, these, even though they're prisoners, they're convicted defendants, they're in the slammer, they still have a right to have their cases or their issues heard as they do. So I eventually persuaded him that if I worked on the cases, um, he would let me proceed with that. So. Okay, um, Mayanna, continue. What is your general judicial philosophy? Mm -hmm. So my general judicial philosophy is that I don't want to rest on my laurels and I don't think anyone should, no matter what their backgrounds is. I think I have demonstrated, you could take again a look at my demonstrable record, that I can research and write about the law and do that really well and deal, deal with people on the spot as I do every single day. I think it's important for judges to keep researching and to keep finding out how the law develops and how it should develop. As judges, we can't do that much, that's true. Uh, but there are some recommendations by the legislature and by society in general about uh, the direction in which judges uh, ought to go. So in other words, I'm not this sort of the textualist that thinks, well, the constitution was written and should never develop. I honestly believe that that's not what our founding fathers wanted. So I believe that the law should develop and we should figure out uh, how to do so within the narrow constraints we have, but also based on the uh, interplay that exists between the legislature and the judiciary. So a modern, uh, you know, research-based approach, I would say. Okay, Steve, same question, general judicial philosophy. Yeah, I would just actually just respectfully disagree. I, I think that the judges, uh, role is specific. The judge's role is not to be a legislator, but I never I don't, said that. <laughs> no, please. What? I, I don't think that I don't think that judges can't do much. I actually think within their role, I think judges can do quite a bit, whether it's in family court or whether it's for a criminal defendant that's come before them, whether it's a juvenile that's come before them, whether it's uh, treating the attorneys that have come before them with respect. I think judges actually within their role and with re within their respective lane, I think they have the ability to do, to, to do quite a bit. My philosophy is basically to treat everyone with respect that comes before me, period, end of story. And that's what I've done as a defense attorney and a prosecutor. And it's to work hard to understand the law and to make sure that the law is implemented uh, as it is in front of me. So that's really my philosophy. Thank you. Um, we'll start with Steve on this next question, followed by Mayanna, and that is, what are the biggest challenges you think we need to make in our justice system and your vision for the future of our justice system? So uh, in, in terms of changes to the justice system, we're coming through an incredibly tumultuous period um, with COVID-19. And I'm curious to see how some of these changes remain in effect as we go forward. So, for example, uh, in court every day, folks are have the ability to appear telephonically now, which I think is uh, quite a bit easier. You've seen, I think, a loosening in terms of uh, defendants' abilities to appear um, 977 or have their attorneys appear for them. Um, 30 seconds. What I think is important is that uh, the, again, that the ju judiciary understands clearly its role within the system. And I think it's important that the judiciary maintains its role within the system, because I think it's important that, that there are changes that are necessary, but that we hold the le legislature's feet to the fire and the executive branch's feet to the fire. And we best do that in the judiciary by understanding our role and making sure that we firmly apply and, and, and fulfill that role. Time. Mayanna. Hey, so you asked specifically what two issues do you think are uh, some of the biz biggest issues to uh, address within uh, the constraints that exist or not um, as it applies. So I will Let answer the question. Uh, to that. Let me repeat the question. Okay. Uh, what are the biggest changes you think we need to make in our justice system? And mm -hmm. what is your vision for the future of the justice system? Yeah, so the biggest issues I think are twofold. I think facts and uh, evidence shows right now that clearly one of the biggest issues is the incredible discrepancy and racial uh, uh, disparities i'm sorry that exist within the racial within the criminal justice system that has to be addressed black men are incarcerated in california 10 times the amount of white males and that is a fact i like to stick to facts another thing is so that has to be addressed from all angles as i like to propose however as possible 
And another big issue is in the civil world that I work with a lot and work with also uh, as a law professor is the access to justice issue. How many people that can afford uh, an attorney? Not enough. So technology can hopefully help us with that. And I'm working on some of that already. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, Mayanna, why don't you give your closing then? Sure, absolutely. Um, so I think, and we all know that LA County and the whole nation, if not the world, but certainly the nation is ready for something different. I'm diverse, I'm an immigrant, I'm female in a male dominated world. I'm from a blue collar family, which has taught me a lot. I'm multilingual. I resemble much more of what LA really looks like. I'm experienced and I'm the high, most highly qualified qualified candidate for this office because I trained with the best state and federal level trial and appellate court judges behind the scenes, giving me insight into the precise nature of this work that I'll be doing thousands of hours or hundreds of cases. I have directly relevant experience in front of a lot of different people on a daily basis dealing with issues from a whole lot of angles and difficult people. Judges read, analyze, write about the law and deal with a lot of different people and I do that and have done that for two decades. I'm balanced, I'm independent, and I have a broad range of support that you could find out about on my website, which is everyone from Maxine Waters to uh, Republicans against Trump and everything in between from real life people. So I'm the most qualified and the only independent candidate for this seat. Steve? Thanks, you. Yeah, I appreciate you allowing us to be here tonight. Yeah, so basically, I believe I'm the best qualified candidate for this seat because I've got the experience. I haven't done it from behind the scenes. I've appeared in court for criminal defendants in courts all over Chicago, all over Los Angeles, and in the military in Kentucky, Texas, and Hawaii. I've appeared in court advocating for real people. As a result of that, the LA Times endorsed us, endorsed me in my campaign. They interviewed us uh, and they endorsed me a, uh, after careful consideration. In addition to that, um, I believe that uh, I've got the temperament too to, to make a great judge. As part of the endorsement process through the LA County Bar, you give them 75 of your colleagues. You give them your colleagues, that's who they talk to to make that determination. I received a well-qualified, my opponent received a not qualified to be a, a judge this election cycle. I don't believe seconds. that just any attorney would make a great law professor. And I don't believe that just any law professor would make a great judge. Thank you. Wow. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you, you and I appreciate it. And now we'll move on to our next candidates uh, for seat number 80, which is David. David, is it Berger? It's Berger, like merger. David Berger. Thank and, you. And Clint, is Clint here? Clint James? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, he's here. Okay, great. Okay. So, um, so uh, David, why don't you start with your opening one and a half minutes? Thank you, Cara. And thank you, everyone at West LA Democrats, uh, for allowing me to introduce myself. As I, you may know from my prior appearances, I, I'm an immigrant. The... Uh, Country of my origin is England, in, in case my accent doesn't give that away. Um, I'm running for seat number 80, judge of the Superior Court. I, I placed in first position in the primary at 45%, not quite enough to make it. Hopefully we'll change that on November the 3rd. I've got 24 ex years of experience at the District Attorney's Office. I currently concentrate on cases involving particularly vulnerable victims, uh, child sex molestation cases, rape victims, domestic violence, stalkers, and hate crimes. The stuff that matters. Um, endorsement wise, I have, I'm very proud to say I have the endorsement of the Los Angeles County Democratic Party, the County Federation of Labor, numerous other um, democratic clubs, seconds. including of course Stonewall Democrats, which again, I'm very proud of. Um, one of the things that was said about me when the Los Angeles Times and the Met News endorsed me was, um, I'd like to just read it to you. Berger enjoys respect amongst deputies in the public defender's office, being seen as fair, courteous, reasonable and ethical. And I think that defines who I am and why I'm running for this position. So I've told you who I am. Um, I'd like to tell you what I'd like to do. Um, Thank you. I might, my time's up. Mm -hmm. I'll save it for the end. Yes. 
good, good thinking. Clint McKay, Clint Thank James. You. Thank you. Yes, um, my name is Clint James McKay. My background is that I was, um, I was uh, homeless at 15 years old, and then I uh, worked my way out of that and went through undergraduate work at the University of Michigan, got an honors degree, a law degree, and then an MBA from the University of California at Berkeley. I was in private practice for 25 years, and then I worked for uh, Jerry Brown and Kamala Harris in the um, Attorney General's office, and then I had been a judge for six years, an administrative law judge for the Department of Social Services. In that capacity, I decide cases regarding health coverage, people who have been denied treatments, people who have been denied various, various things that they, that they need to survive, and I get to decide those cases. I've decided thousands of those cases as a judge. Uh, I write, I write um, decisions every day that hopefully will help people continue to live. And that's what I do. I was also the uh, chairman of the board of the largest children's charity in California, the Exceptional Children's Foundation. And um, I have also been rated well qualified by the Los Angeles County Bar Association. Uh, I think Mr. Morgan and I, I could be wrong, but I think Mr. Morgan and I are the only ones who have been rated well qualified in this race, um, in these races. And uh, I believe with Brian Stevenson that we are all better than the worst thing that we've ever done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Clint, um, are there some institutional changes that need to be made that would create more justice? And, and like, what would make courtrooms better? Court, well, there, well there's, there are two separate questions. One is if you say, what are institutional changes that need to be made? I would say that far too many people are imprisoned. Far, far too many people are imprisoned. We need to, we need to work out a system whereby we are creating people who can re-enter society as productive members rather than imprisoning, imprisoning them for political purposes, which is largely what we're doing now. That particularly targets people of minority. Now, in, in the actual courtrooms, of course, we can take into account, as I often do, the people's ability. I'm sorry, I didn't hear her. 30 I, seconds. 30 seconds. I, I, as I often do, I take in, into account the ability of people to present their case, to be able to represent themselves. As, because most of the people that I, that I deal with are unrepresented, I am called upon to make sure that they get treated fairly. That is what I do every single day. Thank you. Okay, next. My turn? Yeah. Oh. Same, same question. Yeah, so are um, there, get it? Yeah. Okay, well, I, I have to say, I, I basically agree with much of what Mr. McKay said. Um, we. We have far too many people in prison. Our system has been one of retribution and not enough rehabilitation. As a deputy district attorney, I was the person selected to work in the alternative sentencing courts where we work to find ways to let people get a chance to turn their lives around. That doesn't mean a slap on the wrist and off you go. That means we give them something to do, a sense of achievement so they have a sense of work. 30 seconds. And hopefully they won't repeat the conduct that got them into the system in the first place. The other thing we need to do as part of my platform is to concentrate more on our juveniles, the young people who are getting into trouble. We don't want to keep turning young offenders into adult offenders and more effort must be made at the juvenile level if we're gonna make an effective change. I think that's probably my time. Very close, thank you. Well, David, you were so good. We're gonna let you start again. And so this question has to do with ethical dilemma. And please describe an instance in which you face an ethical dilemma and how you dealt with it. 1996, I was uh, a certified law clerk with the DA's office. My job was to present uh, preliminary hearings. Uh, this was a case I was given a uh, third strike, 25 years to life. What did the man do? He was a, a landscaper. He was driving through a park in Culver City and he saw a weed whacker on the ground and he picked it up, put it in his truck and drove off. Unfortunately, Culver City PD were right there and they arrested him. I couldn't in all conscience allow this to go forward. And yet I was a young clerk. So I asked my supervisor what to do and she said, well, go to, to, go to talk to the head deputy, see what they want to do. And that's what I did. I put my career on the line because why should I care about a person I've never met, don't know, 
but the idea that somebody would spend 25 to life for stealing a weed whacker that cost $300 was unconscionable to me. And that's been my guiding, I got hired Thank by you. the way, and that's been my way throughout my career. Thank you. Clint, same question. Ethical Zulema. Thank you. Um, when I was at the Attorney General's office, I was investigating a psychiatrist who had, who had dealt drugs for various, uh, to various people, mostly young people. And when we showed up for court, his lawyer was drunk, was clearly drunk. And so then the question became, do we go forward uh, or do we not? And so what I chose to do was to say to the judge that um, this lawyer didn't look well, that he seemed to be unwell and that maybe we should do this another time. The lawyer spoke up and said, oh no, I'm fine. I said, well, you don't look really, you don't look really well. I think that you, you probably ought to, ought to go home, you ought to try this another time. And finally he got the fact that I realized that he was drunk and I was giving him a way out. And we were able to do the trial another time and we were able to do the investigation another time when he could be sober. And I, I, as, as a representative of the Attorney General's office, I, I couldn't go forward against somebody who wasn't represented by a competent lawyer. Thank you. Okay, so um, Clint, what is your general judicial philosophy? I think that it has to be justice tempered with mercy. I think that every day, as I said, I see people who are frightened. When they come before us, before me, they are frightened. They are worried about their health. They are worried about being in front of a judge. They are, they are up against a representative from Cover California or from the counties or from the Department of Healthcare Services who are professionals. And they're, they're intimidated. And it is absolutely critical that you make sure that within that context, you have justice uh, and, you, and you get all the facts and you, and you create a record that, that brings the right result. So I think that it's, it's, and this is what I was saying before about the fact that too many people are in prison. We need to work out a system that isn't just taking people from schools, putting them in prison, taking people from the streets, putting them in prison, and we don't really care what happens to them afterwards. That's wrong. It's not just, Thank you. and it needs to be changed. David? Um, General. My philosophy uh, is basically that the law has to be fair, just, and it has to make sense. And I think what you're uh, asking in this question is whether we're the sort of strict constructionalist or whether we believe in interpreting the law. The law can sometimes produce bizarre, absurd results. I gave you an example of one with the weed whacker earlier on. Um, that was handled by me as a, as a law clerk, but had I been a judge, I would have interpreted the third strikes law applying Romero, which is a, another uh, Supreme Court decision, which allows a judge to dismiss those strikes to produce an, a just result. And that's, I believe, what my philosophy would be. Um, you have to follow the law, but you mustn't produce a, a ridiculous or unconscionable result. And uh, that's the way I would approach that. Thank issue. you. Okay. Thank you, David. Um, I'd like you to give your closing remarks of one and a half minutes, followed by Clint doing the same. Well, thank you very much again for paying attention to us, to us all. Um, jurors, or rather, voters don't get to know enough about judges, and this is a great opportunity for you to find out something about it. I saw something in the, in the chat before from somebody who said that all judges should be appointed by the governor rather than by election for that reason. And it's interesting, you know, Judge uh, Jerry Brown appointed 166 judges in the eight years he was on the bench. There were 30 judges who were appointed through the various elections in that time. It's a unique opportunity for you voters to weigh in on who you want to be a judge. You don't get much of a say in it. If you vote for me, you'll get a judge who has been endorsed by the Los Angeles Times, endorsed by the Los Angeles County Democratic Party, endorsed by over 50 judges who I've appeared before and who know me, endorsed by def public defenders, defense attorneys, 
um, I, I believe I'm the right choice for this seat. Thank you. Thank you. Clint? Thank you. Uh, I also have endorsements of a former senior attorney general, for assistant attorney general from the Department of Justice, supervising attorney, attorney, attorneys general, say that five times fast, any number of uh, people that I work with in the attorney general's office, and a number of judges who I work with now. Um, I think, though, that that the primary deciding factor is whether we want more prosecutors in the bench. Certainly, I don't think this, this election is about who's going to be a competent judge. I think Mr. Berger would be a competent judge. I certainly would be a competent judge. I'm a judge now. I think it depends on what you think the, the, the bench should look like. I think you, you need to determine whether or not you want prosecutors in the bench, or whatever you, whatever you even if they're, they try to salt pedal what they've done, they're still prosecutors. Or whether you want a diverse bench, which more represents the people who are out there and have a diversity of experience in the background. I think that's the important thing that not only in this endorsement, but in the election that has to be decided. Thank you. Seconds. I appreciate the time to come and talk to you today. Very much, both of you. I'm really delighted that you came and uh, we'll let you know what's going on at around 9.30 tonight. Um, Thank you. Okay? Thank you. So, bye. Uh, then next for seat number 162, we have David Diamond and Scott Andrew Yang. Is David here? I am. Good evening, everybody. Okay, great. So, um, so uh, David, why don't you start giving us a minute and a half of uh, your opening remarks? Thank you. Good evening, Kara. Thank you. Elena, thank you, and everyone else. Uh, my name is David Diamond, and I'm seeking to become the first criminal justice attorney ever elected to the bench. Uh, we have 80% of the criminal bench are prosecutors. And for some reason, voters always take the safe route and elect prosecutors. So I'm trying to change history and I'm trying to make the bench a little bit my di more diverse by becoming the first ever elected criminal defense attorney. Um, West LA is important for me. I used to live there. My wife and I, our first apartment was over there in La Cienega near Olympic. And about 15 years ago, I was elected to the SoRo Neighborhood Council. I don't know if it's still in existence or not, but I was part of the local neighborhood council. I too endorsed by the LA Times and had a well-qualified rating. I have uh, extensive experience, probably more than most of the candidates in that I have trials in family law, civil law, and criminal law, totaling about 500 trials. Uh, I've, uh, I've served as a volunteer temporary judge uh, I am also state bar certified uh, specialist, which only about 4% of the lawyers get. Uh, I've been practicing for about, about 20 years now. So it's important, I believe, like Judge McKay had said, we need to get a truly fair representation on the bench, which is why this is my second go around doing this, because I'm going to keep trying until we, we get the right results. And I thank everyone for their time this evening. Thank you. Um, Scott? Thank you, Cara. Thank you, everybody, for having all the candidates here tonight. Um, I, uh, I know Mr. Uh, Diamond. He and I actually have been friends for several years. Um, but I, I am an immigrant. I, uh, my family came to the United States in 1979. I was a boat baby, grew up in Echo Park, California. Um, I, did not grow, I did not grow up in any fancy uh, community whatsoever. Um, I went to Virgo Junior High School, which is right in Vermont, and uh, later on went to UCLA and then on to law school. I spent the first five years of my uh, career representing low-income families, and uh, I once joined the DA's office, I uh, fought for basically the most vulnerable victims in our society. I've been rated well qualified by the LA County Bar Association as well as the LA County Democratic Party. Um, just statistically, seconds. thank you. Just statistically, when Governor Brown, um, during his tenure, he actually appointed 80% from the Public Defender's Office. And currently, the statistic is that there are around 47% of the bench officers were former prosecutors. It's, it's really not 80%. Uh, one of the reasons why prosecutors get appointed. Uh, back in the old days, and now it's because DAs are in court Thank all you. the time, and we do trials. Thank you. 
So um, my question is uh, to you, Scott, next, uh, and that is, what are the biggest changes you think uh, need to be made in our justice system? And what is your vision for the future of the justice system? Thank you. I, I think COVID-19 has really shown us how vulnerable we are in the criminal justice system. I think we were unprepared to deal with the Sixth Amendment rights of defendants, uh, many of whom are uh, being held right now without any recourse waiting for trial. I think that we have to use better in terms of the technology that's available to us to make sure that uh, people who are accused are not waiting indefinitely for their day in court. Um, and, I think, and I think that the uh, judicial system has to uh, always keep in mind of people's rights. And uh, with that, they have to use greater use of technology more than what we've been doing now to accomplish that goal. Mm. Your vision? Uh, I see a court system that is more transparent uh, for and greater access for everyone to seek justice. I agree with- uh, uh, Thank some, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. David, same question. Um, do you want me to do both answers or one or, or take it one question at a time? Uh, take both, both questions, biggest changes and your vision. Well, the biggest changes we have right now is how to handle the uh, largest court population in the country. Los Angeles County courts handle more cases than any county in the country. So you have to start with accessibility and availability. Uh, the complaint that often comes down from that is that uh, when you're a litigant, you didn't get the right to be heard. So the, the changes we're having right now is to give everyone the right to have their case be heard, to give them the access to be heard. And obviously challenging times right now, we have our COVID-19 where all trials, all trials are frozen right now. So we've made it accessible through WebEx and through telephonic appearances. So as, as society changes, so should technology. So I think that it's the technological growth to give people access to be heard. Thank you. As for the future, do you want me to do part two? Mm -hmm. As for the future, I think um, my, my primary principle and belief is access to the court system. People just can't get it and also removing social economic barriers. People without finances don't get an opportunity. I'm, a, I'm an appointed public defender, meaning that the county appoints me uh, to represent thank you so much. defendants. Thank you. Um, so, um, uh, um, are there some institutional changes that need to be made? The question we asked before that create more justice and second half, what would make courtrooms better? Who should answer first, Cara? You want me to do it or David? Go ahead. I, I think one of the institutional changes that should be made is uh, the zero bail issue. I think that uh, for the most part, a lot of the low-level misdemeanors and even some felonies where the uh, defendant has no criminal history whatsoever, uh, I think we should take a much more serious look at zero bail for a lot of the types of crimes because I think oftentimes, uh, obviously, it affects poorer uh, defendants at a greater, much greater uh, percentage than obviously some of the... 30 seconds. Um, I think that having greater access to the court system is very important, showing respect to everybody who comes before the court and having a judge who essentially makes it, who's reminded that the court is basically a public room and not his courtroom. Uh, so I think that's one of the things that I would institute if I were to be uh, honored enough to be elected to judge. David? Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry, my audio went out for a moment, Kara. Okay. Are there some institutional changes that need to be made that would create more justice? And what would make courtrooms better? Well, the first answer easily is economic barriers. Um, I, ha I just finished representing a woman who was incarcerated for 18 years for a crime she did not commit. And she didn't have the ability to have uh, high profile lawyers come in there and help us. We, we, we were appointed the case and we ended up staying on the case and eventually got her out. This happens all the time. Uh, when I was a judge pro tem doing traffic, you used to in the old days have to pay bail before you could fight your traffic ticket. I removed that before it became a standard, got some grief for it because I believe people shouldn't be strapped Second. with financial burdens. In terms of the future, I think we need uh, courthouses to have be better budgeted 
to be spread out through the county in better locations, the upkeep of the, of the courtrooms, cleaner courtrooms, and also make people work the hours they're supposed to be, like judges, like DAs, like public defenders. Work a full day and get the job done, and that'll help get everyone equal access to be heard and remove some of the financial barriers. Thanks, David. This question's for you. Um, please describe one instance in which you face an ethical dilemma, and how did you resolve it? Well, I think attorneys face an ethical dilemma every day because our rules of ethics require that we zealously defend our clients while maintaining an ethical balance. And I think one of the most important things I did, and I'll, I'll relate to the young lady that I just represented for 18 years, uh, the DA's office refused to acknowledge their error. They refused to admit that this woman was wrongfully incarcerated. And in fact, the DA that was handling the case uh, is a pretty high ranking member of the office. And I felt that some of the uh, arguments in court and some of the motions she were writing were disingenuous and fact, factually incorrect. A, a lawyer is not supposed to uh, question the integrity or the character of opposing counsel unless absolutely uh, necessary or they can be sanctioned themselves. But I had to, I had to call her out because we, again, we had somebody that was in jail that for something she didn't do. So I made a report to the supervisor, uh, written report because I thought her, her argument was false and embellished and I did it. And now my client's home with her, uh, with her daughter who he, she hasn't seen since she went in 18 years. Thank you. God. Thank you. Um, unlike uh, a lot of the defense attorneys, my, my obligation is to the people of the state of California. My obligation is not to zealously defend and represent any single person. It is to seek justice. And that means doing justice when the opportunity is there. One of the greatest examples that I have is I have a night, I saw a 19 year old autistic defendant coming to court who essentially moved uh, three people to the back of a uh, game store and was charged, thank you, and was charged for kidnapping, which essentially is a life uh, time punishment. Um, I uh, advocated tremendously to my supervisor that this person does not deserve to go to prison for life, even though the charge uh, requires it. And we ended up actually giving him probation because that's what justice is. And so I believe that uh, good judges not only believe in the letter of the law, but also the spirit of the law and take every case on a case by case basis. Thank you. Okay, so now it's time for your closing statements. One and a half minutes. Um, you want to start, um, Scott? You want to do your closing statement first? Sure. Um, I, I know that there is always a lot of uh, questions about why so many prosecutors are on the bench. There is actually a myth that uh, that people believe that prosecutors are tougher on defendants. Uh, criminal within the criminal bar, it is well known that most prosecutors are the most. Uh, even-handed when it comes to evaluating defendants. I will tell you that my principle in, in running a courtroom is that I believe in treating every, every indi individual as an individual and not based upon the charge that, they've been, uh, that they have received or the crimes that they've been charged with. I believe in looking at a person's uh, complete background I believe in looking at where the person comes from and what, are, uh, and what it was that took this person to where they're at uh, when, it, when it's time to dealing with the individual. My philosophy is always to treat everybody with respect. 30 and seconds. Fairness. And uh, I, like I've said previously, I've been endorsed by numerous uh, Democratic clubs. I've worked for all the Democratic clubs. I've appeared at every Democratic club fighting for their endorsement. And I think that you go to my website and you look at uh, my background in its entirety, that I have empathy for individuals and that uh, after you've reviewed that, I hope that you will find that I am worthy of your support and your endorsement because it is truly important for me. Thank you. That. Okay, so you're next, David. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to briefly thank everybody for their time. Scott, always a pleasure to see you. Uh, I have a pretty simple philosophy if elected as a bench officer, and that's prepare, planning, and participation. Prepare for the hearings, read the motions. Planning, be ready to be in court and do what needs to be done, and participation. Allow everybody the right to, to have their voice heard. 
Now, obviously, in any election, uh, you hear different comments. This is for a judge. This is not a president or state senator. Um, so partisan issues aside, I like the independence of the West LA Democrat Club. Yes, when I ran last time, I got the LA County Democratic Party's endorsement. This time I did not. But let's remember that process. There's five people in a room that make the decision, probably a predetermined decision. There's no chance with COVID this year to get nominated off the floor. So that being said, this is a more independent, less political process, which is why I'm participating with everyone tonight. Um, truth be told, 80% of the judges in criminal courts are former DAs, and that needs to change. I believe in diversity on race, religion, sexual orientation, and your background, which means we need more defense attorneys who come and see more and adhere to more and do it on a regular basis. So again, thank you very much. Uh, I'm the only candidate that has been endorsed from a judge from every courthouse in the county. Yeah, thank you so much, gentlemen. I really appreciate you coming with you both the best of luck. And as soon as we get our, our uh, election results at around 9.30 or so tonight, we'll um, let you know. Okay, so thank you. So for our next candidate coming up, um, this is for uh, Board of Supervisors, District 2, my district. Uh, we have the illustrious Senator Holly Mitchell joining us. So Ms. Holly, are you ready? I'm ready, Ms. Carol. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Holly. You look adorable. <laughs> oh, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Okay, so I'm glad I was able to sign on and listen to some of the judicial candidates. That was very helpful information. Thanks, West LA Dems, for creating this opportunity for all of us. Okay, so uh, we have your opening, and um, and, it, and it's a minute and a half. I want to make sure I follow the rules. Two minutes. Excellent. Right. Good evening, West LA Dems. I am State Senator Holly Mitchell and a proud candidate for the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors District 2. Was very proud to open my newspaper yesterday and see the LA Times um, really strong endorsement of my candidacy. And I was proud because I think it outlined my 10 year history as a state legislator in both the assembly and the Senate in terms of my progressive politics and issues that I have focused on really my entire political career. So I'm very pleased about that. You know, if elected to the Board of Supervisors, quite frankly, my top three priority issues are the same that they were pre-COVID because what I am fully understanding and witnessing every day that the communities that have been, uh, are most vulnerable to the public health and economic pandemic we're in the middle of are the same communities that were susceptible to uh, living in communities that um, are, uh, that they're having difficulty affording housing, that are food deserts, that are mental health and health facility deserts. And so my top three priorities are the same. It's to create and continue to plan and figure out a permanent sustainable solution to deal with LA counties unhoused, our family, friends, and neighbors who can not afford housing in our own home county or those who need a little additional support to figure out a permanent sustainable solution. One that we acknowledge we can't build our way out of quick enough. We see right now in our own neighborhoods that for, one, for every 100 residents that the city is able to house, another 112 lose their housing every day. And so we've got to figure out a broad brush stroke in terms of how we keep people housed where they are, as well as build and create affordable, sustainable housing for the long term. Second priority is mental health services. When I look at the second supervisorial district, it is a district that is steep in history, but it is also a district that has great needs, particularly with regard to mental health services. Thank you, thank you. Oh, yes, Holly, I don't know if, if you were here in the beginning when I ex explained the process, but rather than saying time, Michelle is very gently going to say thank you. I appreciate that. And I spend too much of my time with hello. So I apologize. No, it's fine. You know what? Let's elaborate further on what you just broke up, uh, brought up about homelessness. Because here on the West Side is exploding, as you know, all through LA County. We all know that. But what would three priorities and goals be? I mean, really, you know, goals, priorities to to decrease homelessness and encampments. Mm -hmm. 
No. We have to help people stay where they are. There are too many a LA County residents who are, um, whose housing situation currently is fragile. Uh, you know, when we do the point in time count, it is a point in time that day. We aren't counting the people who are couch surfing. We're not counting the people who lose their housing on the first of the month, the very following month. So I care to build in the legislature that stop discrimination um, um, based on the source of income. We were sending hundreds of vouchers back to the federal government, veterans vouchers and section eight vouchers every day because landlords weren't accepting them. So we have to look at our current infrastructure, current government funded programs and use them more efficiently. I know that the Board of Supervisors is interested in reimagining LASA. And I know a number of people are concerned about what they read um, is being spent um, of their H and HHH dollars on building new units, um, um, the, the cost per unit. So I think we have to be smarter, more strategic and creative in terms of how we come up with housing for our current unhoused. Okay. Good, thank you. Holly, my next question has to do with COVID uh, and specifically what will you do to address COVID response and recovery and specifically how would you address the equitable allocation of the COVID vaccines? Oh my gosh, that's a really excellent question and that's going to have to be a partnership between the county public health department and the state public health department. Um, I think the real fight will be to recognize that LA County has got to get its fair share based on our sheer population. That's a fight I engage in the state legislature every day to make sure that we get our fair share of resources based on population. Uh, but it will really have to be a collaborative effort in how we braid our systems, our public health system, our private health system, to make sure that everyone, regardless of immigration status and regardless of your ability to pay, has access to that vaccine once it's available and we're clear that it's safe. Okay. Did I hear time? It's fine. Um, so here's, here's one. What, what is your plan for addressing racism and policing the cities and the unincorporated areas? You know, Cara, I appreciate that. And the plan has got to not just be my plan. The plan has got to be our collective plan. I was uh, shocked to see the County Oversight Committee demand the, 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 the uh, sheriff's resignation today and two board members who have signed on to that. That's going to be a tricky situation since he's a duly elected official. But I think bills I have voted on to really put some teeth in the Oversight Commission to give them um, subpoena power. Bills I have voted on for 10 years now. 30 seconds. That talk about equity and justice in our criminal justice system. The bills that I've co-authored and supported around police transparency and accountability. Making sure that this sheriff stands up to his word and commitment to allow and purchase the body cams for his sheriffs. I think my track record in the legislation around police accountability and equity really stands for itself. Okay. Um, I have a, another question. It's a little tricky question. Um, if you think it's not, if you don't want to answer it, okay. But you know, there's a lot of talk about this. And would you support the expansion of the LA Board of Supervisors for greater diversity and representation from the present number of five to 15 members like our city council has? I don't know. That, I, I think that we have to research and figure out what is the most appropriate number. I don't think we should automatically assume that it should be a, a parallel to the, to the city of LA. You know, voters across this county um, have had the opportunity to vote to expand the board and they've denied it every time. So mm -hmm. I think we have to really uh, engage in voter education to figure out why when given the opportunity voters have denied it. There was a bill before me in the Senate that I did not support several years ago because I didn't think it uh, was being presented by a, 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 a member who had the right motivation. I thought it was personal political gain, quite frankly. Um, so I would support putting it back before the voters, for the voters to decide. Okay, that's fair. Do you want to um, tell us, just kind of close, just give us some uh, words of wisdom here, why we should vote for you? <laughs> I appreciate that. First of all, I'm honored to have this support of many of the most progressive Democratic hubs in our county, including Stonewall, Blade, Culver City, the East Area Progressives, Heart of LA, Black Women's Dem Club, Miracle Mile, and West Side Young Dems. Proud to have the endorsement of Sierra Club, Planned Parenthood, CLCB, and UFW. Uh, I mentioned earlier the LA Times endorsement, and I think that endorsement really 
um, helped create a picture of the difference between my um, primary opponent and myself. Uh, I want to go to the Board of Supervisors for the same reason I ran 10 years ago for the State Assembly, to create an opportunity for equity for the people who live in the second district. I think I've proven my ability to deliver, uh, having chaired the state budget committee now for four years. I think I've proven my ability to dig deep down in policy in issues. I have proven my ability to uh, be an elected official with integrity uh, and honesty. I'm proud that the LA Times and my colleagues have referred to me as the moral compass of the legislature. I think that's what we need in elective office across the board um, now more than ever. Uh, and I really hope I can count on your endorsement to be your next supervisor to the LA County Board of Supervisors. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for taking the time to come and okay. seek endorsement. Thank you so much for the invitation. I appreciate you all. Thank you. Okay, so next on our agenda, is the Los Angeles Community College District Board of Trustees races. And uh, again, we are going to have one and a half minutes for an opening and closing statements, three questions, one minute response each. And on this, on, on these races, uh, we're, Elena and I are just gonna split races. Like uh, Elena is going to take race number one with Miss Andra Hoffman. So, Andra, you want to come up and give your opening statement? Thank you so much. It's very exciting to be here tonight, and I really am enjoying the meeting and learning a lot, so I'm glad I tuned in right away. I'm sorry? Club member for a long time, Andra. <laughs> Anyway, good evening, everyone. I'm Andra Hoffman, and I currently serve as president of the Board of Trustees for the Los Angeles Community College District. Um, I was first elected to the board in 2015 and was proud, so proud to earn your endorsement then. In addition to serving on the board, I'm a community college educator. I have 23 years of experience uh, working at Glendale Community College. And when I ran, I promised to increase success rates amongst our students and streamline the pathway for students to reach their goals. So since 2015, our transfer rates to the CSUs and the UCs have increased by 24%, and the number of degrees and certificates awarded uh, have increased by 57%. And this is important because the state average in terms of degrees and certificates um, have only increased around 47% since 2015. Um, and I'm really proud that West LA College has one of 15 bachelor's degrees uh, awarded to community colleges in the state of California. Ours is the most successful right here in your backyard and we have a bachelor's degree program in dental hygiene. So whether they come to us right from high school or are returning for a degree or a certificate, our students are facing unprecedented barriers as we all know. Students are plagued with unemployment, online learning, homeschooling their own children while they're trying to learn, issues around access to technology, the internet, um, food insecurity, and affordable housing. My experience matters and I'm running for re-election so that I can continue to support the students we serve. The Los Angeles district uh, has nine colleges and one right here in your backyard. Um, I believe we are gonna be a key partner as uh, we look toward the economic recovery of Los Angeles County. So thank you, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. I wanna hear you continue. Uh, you've identified racism, poverty, food insecurity, homelessness, immigration policy. So my question is, what programs will you put in place to secure or ensure students' academic success? Um, yeah, thank you for that question. You know, we are in the middle of actually putting together a framework for racial equity and social justice. Under my leadership, the chancellor has created a framework which we get a report out on every board meeting. And just yesterday, he appointed a task force on um, African-American student affairs. So number one, that's, that's extremely important to ensure that our students um, are gonna be getting you know, fair and equal treatment, number one, feel comfortable on our campuses or in our virtual campuses. Um, and make sure that you know, we're addressing the issue of systemic racism throughout the entire community college system. We have a call to action from the statewide chancellor's office. Um, we also have in place some equity programs. So we have money through a program called Student Equity um, and, and Access and Success. 
And so we are able to identify disproportionately affected groups of students um, and allocate extra funds to be able to serve those students. Because we all know it's not just about the academics, it's about all of the wraparound services as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, second question has to do with COVID. Given the COVID economy and the loss of tax revenue, what are your priorities and how will you address budget cuts? So we've been really fortunate right now that we're able to not have to cut any programs or staff currently. You know, we've had a lot of COVID related expenses. Um, the money coming through the state has been deferred, which is a good thing. And, you know, we're waiting for some reimbursements by the federal government. Obviously, we're going to look if we have to do budget cuts in areas that are non student related. So we don't want to cut any programs or services that directly affect our students. And we don't want to cut faculty. So we want to look at areas, you know, right now, um, we can probably do some things around administrative services, you know, the paper, the copy machines, the pens, all of that stuff. Um, those would be the areas that we would cut first. And we're really proud of the fact that we have a healthy reserve at the LA Community College District. Great. Uh, third question, what climate change actions will you take and what is your plan for success? Um, that's a great question. So we just passed a resolution on um, becoming more sustainable by 2030, uh, some short term goals. And then the longer term goal is to be 100% um, off of you know, carbon fuels by 2040. Uh, we also have programs in place around sustainability. So we've got some academic programs at some of our college campuses, and um, we've been very involved. We just won an award for our green building program, which is really exciting. So thank you for that question. Okay, you were great in terms of answering those questions. And so would you like to conclude with uh, closing statements of about a minute and a half? Sure, thank you. Um, I'm trying to be very mindful of the time here. So I'm currently the only woman on the seven member LACCD board. I've been endorsed by the six unions that have employees in the district, AFT Faculty and Staff Guild, SEIU 99, SEIU 721, the Teamsters and the Building Trades. I've also earned the endorsement of the LA County Democratic Party, the LA County Federation of Labor, the mayor of Los Angeles, Eric Garcetti, and numerous uh, Democratic clubs and elected officials. I think um, as of tonight, I, I've been endorsed by 16 Democratic clubs and still counting. Um, folks, we are in the middle of a movement, not just a moment. And the time now is to reimagine and redesign the Los Angeles Community College District. Now is the time to ensure that our programs and services are relevant and meet the needs of the community. Now's the time to dismantle the status quo and root out racism in everything we do, from hiring practices to curriculum development, to ensuring that we are inclusive of our student body. And I believe at this time, we need experience. We need a board member such as myself who has that experience. I have the experience because I work daily with students at another community college in another district. Um, so I'm really hoping that you will endorse me again for this seat. I look forward to working with all of you and I'm really looking forward to what the future holds. Um, in closing, I'm actually gonna borrow a phrase, a quote that our Chancellor Francisco Rodriguez um, says often. Um, and he is our only employee as trustees. So he says, the public gives us three things. They give us their resources. So you all pass bond measures and thank you so much for that. Um, they give us their trust and they give us their children. And in the case of community colleges, they give us their parents to educate. Thank so you. I would be very honored to earn your endorsement this evening. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. much. Yeah, thank you for coming and being here, giving our endorsement yet again. <laughs> okay, so uh, next up, we have the LACCD seat number three candidates. Anthony, Dana, and David Vella. And remember everyone, um, I hope you're taking notes, you know, so that when your ballots come, you'll, you'll know who to vote for easily to try and remember. Okay, so um, you each get a minute and a half to introduce yourselves. Anthony, you want to start? Sure. Thank you very much, Kara. Nice Good evening. You. I'm Anthony Dana. I'm a first generation college graduate who started at community college and is now a senior executive in Hollywood. 
I'm seeking this seat on the Board of Trustees because the Los Angeles Community College District is plagued with persistent management issues, particularly with respect to how money is spent and that fails each and every one of us. This district's board has failed to make good decisions when managing their $9 billion construction bond program over the last decade, and those issues persist to this day. Entrenched relationships between incumbent board members and the construction management firms that fund their campaigns suggest pay-to-pay -pay politics drives decision-making. This district is large enough and important enough to lead when it chooses to, but it repeatedly fails to do so. The district's implementation of key reforms like those contained in AB 705 run even at best according to the Campaign for College Opportunity. Housing and food insecurity issues weigh on students, but the district has taken fewer steps than others have to address these issues. Despite efforts to improve student success, over half of the district's colleges perform below their local peers do on the primary measure of student success, which is the percentage of students who receive a certificate a degree or transfer. There is a lot of room for improvement. I'm running for this seat because the honest and hardworking people of LA deserve a community college system that is as honest and hardworking as they are. And I have the commitment and the ability to make the vision a reality. I muted myself. David Vela. Hi everyone, thank you so much uh, for being here tonight. It is truly an honor to be here with you and thank you for your advocacy, uh, for being out there in the forefront, uh, ensuring that our democratic values uh, stay alive here in our, in our county. Uh, my name is David Bella and I'm the incumbent in C3. I was appointed two years ago. I'm homegrown here in, in Los Angeles, went to UCLA uh, and Pepperdine grad school. I'm a former instructor former American Federation of Teachers uh, member. I'm also endorsed by Equality California, the Los Angeles County Democratic Party, as well as the American Federation of Teachers and Stonewall Dems. Um, you know, we are in a very, very uh, different time today in society. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we have to believe that, you know, our community colleges are gonna be open for, for the public, for everyone, you know, as our county begins to rebuild itself after COVID-19, we have to ensure that our students graduate, that they uh, get into certification, uh, pass, as well as transfer. And you know, the, the improvements are coming along extremely fast. We are top 10 in uh, transferring over to the UC system. Uh, both East LA College and Pierce College are taking the lead in that. Uh, we are also um, ensuring that our students are getting the job training they need. So I, as soon as I got appointed in 2018, I ensured that the LAX uh, apprenticeship program continued where we put our students into uh, high paying jobs. Thank you. Okay, well, um, let's continue then. Uh, you were starting to say, this is, this is a, your first question. Both of you will be answering this question. Um, David, what kind of career pathways and certifications would you put in place to assure a lifelong path to higher wage jobs? Thank you, Kara, so much. I really appreciate that question. And as I was uh, mentioning, you know, we're continuing to add on to the current uh, LAX workforce, uh, LAX workforce program, where we're putting students into uh, the new construction uh, jobs out at LAX um, in fields that are not just, uh, you know, construction workers, but engineers and planners and safety technicians. Um, one thing that I brought to the district, um, I've been endorsed by LA County Assessor Jeff Prang, um, and he called me and said, hey, if Prop 15 passes, uh, we're gonna need more appraisers uh, at, at the LA County Assessor's Office. So I brought that partnership, I called uh, uh, LA County Supervisor Hilda Solis, and we put together a program that will train appraisers so that the assessor can raise more revenue and put those into schools, as you know, Prop 15 will do. Um, so that's just one example. Obviously, we have a huge uh, commitment from the LA County Fire Department where we train our future uh, fire uh, personnel and firefighters. Um, and so we have that and, and I'm putting more resources into our, our students in order to train. One thing that I, I love to Thank see you. as an openly LGBT, uh, first uh, open LGBT trustee is We've worked together to put more women. Uh, I've, you know, gotten the work by the Orange County Federation. Your time. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Anthony, no, no problem. Anthony, uh, same question. What kind of career pathways and certifications 
would you think to put in place to assure a lifelong path to higher wage jobs? Sure. So uh, it's an excellent question. And the first thing I would do is actually something I would do um, programmatically across the entire district. And, and I know it's something that the, the district is already working on and that they have programs in this area. Um, but it's something I think uh, that needs further expansion and focus. And that's 21st century skills development. Um, I come from the private sector. I've been working on the front lines of a global changing economy. And I know firsthand uh, that the types of skills that people need to be successful for the jobs of the future are skills that they could be taught and start developing at their community colleges. I also believe that we need to create pathways into the growth sectors that will drive LA's economy forward, including biotech and healthcare. The one area I really want to expand is uh, green jobs and clean energy uh, pathways for the district students. Uh, the district has some programs in this area, but certainly not designed at the scale uh, that we need to have in order to fulfill the jobs that Thank Joe you. Biden and others want to create uh, to have a green recovery. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Anthony, continuing, what, what will you do to address the unique needs of students who are undocumented, homeless, disabled, transgender, and or racially and religiously diverse? So while, while a lot of student groups have unique needs, there are a few issues that, that unite um, students across uh, any particular uh, you know, division that you might uh, put them in. And that relates to the issues of housing and food insecurity. Uh, and I'd like to be able to tackle these issues head on. Uh, these issues are not unknown to the district and they've certainly put programs in place to address them. And I applaud all of those efforts. The thing that I have the problem with is the uh, fact that the district has been studying these issues since at least 2015, food insecurity since 2017, um, and they've stalled out on their ability to address these issues relative to the work that other districts in the Southland have, have uh, what they've been able to achieve. David? Thank you, Kara, again, for that question. Um, you know, absolutely, we, we are tackling those issues. As a matter of fact, um, I went ahead and led the um, a project with LA Room and Board uh, with Shower of Hope to put aside about 60 uh, uh, units for our homeless uh, students um, so that they're able to study, go to West LA College, and also East LA College, we teamed up with Hovind and Sink. And it's, that's just the beginning. We're also um, ensuring that our students are um, recipients of, for example, the CARES Act money. So due to my leadership as chair of the Public Affairs and Legislative okay. Board, we lobbied Washington, D.C. to ensure the CARES Act money would be able to cover some of the DREAMers expenses, uh, as well as um, ensuring that they get the resources needing, uh, that they need. Um, you know, it's, it's been a challenge, but I think that you can see in my record, I voted just two weeks ago to ensure that 30,000 laptops hit our students. That was also due to my leadership and President Hoffman, where we uh, put COVID-19 block in the state of California. Okay, um, so we, we talk about COVID and we know all this online. It's, it, it's so much now online, just like we're doing our Zoom meetings. And there are so many students that, and faculty say that, well, that's, they need safety you know, during COVID. I'm, hopefully you all are, are taking that in. But what can you do specifically to make sure the students have access to devices and the internet, you know, to have Wi-Fi, to, to be able to access their courses? What can you do about that in this time? Um, Anthony. Well, I know the district uh, and, and Trustee Hoffman talked about this uh, in her remarks. The district is, is moved mountains to be able to provide the students uh, that they serve with the equipment and the services that they need to be successful during this time. I'd actually uh, take this question and use it as an opportunity to talk about the, uh, the actual delivery of, of the educational product uh, through distance learning. Um, I received my second master's degree through an online distance learning program. I know exactly what it takes to uh, be a student in this space and what it takes to be successful. And that's the area that I want the district to focus on more is preparing students and, um, and further uh, developing their, their faculty for the delivery of coursework uh, through these platforms. It's not easy and it takes a lot of, of effort and iteration. Thank you. 
absolutely. Uh, David? You know, COVID-19 came without a warning. And so we had to ensure that there was no interruption to our students. And that's what we did. You know, we pushed our screen break ahead. We pushed um, our uh, courses uh, online in a record time in two weeks. Our faculty were amazing. They were right there with us, our students as well. Uh, we provided, again, the laptops. Uh, I worked together with the state legislator, Berman, uh, to do AB 2884, which is going to now allow us to use lottery funds to increase hotspots and internet connection, work with the nonprofit called Human IT that also brought together, um, you know, access to low, low uh, cost, uh, you know, internet connection throughout our whole district and our whole county. And as I mentioned before, we had a block grant that also covered a lot of our uh, costs for ensuring that our students and faculty were also uh, trained and had the necessary technology. And actually before that, we had already been strengthening our Wi-Fi spots through our uh, build LACCD bond. No, I'm on. Yeah, I know. No, I muted my video. Thank you. Not talk, uh, people, mute yourselves, please, if you're going to have cross talk. Uh, thank you. Sorry. Um, David, would you like to um, do your closing minute and a half? Yes, thank you so much, Karen. Th thanks to all of you again. Um, you know, we really, um, the, our leadership has been tested. And what you see from the LACCD Board of Trustees and myself is that we've put um, our money where our mouth is. We've allocated $1.3 million for African American and people of color and LGBT outreach. I started the first ever district-wide lavender graduation uh, that, you know, people are now proud to graduate. Um, with their peers that are LGBT. I also began the process of ensuring that our students had housing through our partnerships with LA Room and Board and several nonprofits, and also setting aside tax credits so that uh, we're able to, in the future, team up with the city of Los Angeles and the state to uh, build housing opportunities around our, our communities. And then I'm very, very proud of the fact that, you know, we did college year uh, promise, college promise year two, which um, is uh, free tuition for our students. Um, this takes away a big burden that's going to add to the uh, increase in, in certification and completion. Thank you. Thank you. Anthony? Thank you. Uh, I want to thank you all for having me here tonight. I realize that I'm not a traditional candidate for this office, but these aren't traditional times. This district needs a trustee who can hold management to account, and I'm the only candidate for any seat with the type of experience required to do just that. I bring 20 years of experience delivering results for two of the largest studios in town. At Disney, I left North America for the first time at age 28 to launch what is now the largest television business in India. More recently, I led a successful turnaround effort for Sony's branded television businesses in Latin America. I know how to build coalitions to deliver results with diplomacy, and that's exactly what this fractured board needs. I took the hard path in Hollywood, working my way up from a clerical position to where I'm at today. Over the last 15 years, I've been working on the front lines of a global technological revolution. And I'm running to use that experience to ensure this district students are prepared for today's jobs and the jobs of the future that haven't even been invented yet. The changing world of work and what that means for jobs isn't theoretical for me, it's my everyday. I wanna thank you for having me here tonight. Your endorsement of this campaign will allow Los Angeles to build back better with a much stronger community college system. Thank you. Thank you. I think thank you very much, both of you, uh, Anthony Dana and David Vella. I really appreciate, we all appreciate you coming out here and seeking our endorsement. And as I said, we'll, we'll see it around 930, <laughs> how the ballots play out. So stick around if you like, and uh, on to the next set of candidates. Elena. So um, I'm really pleased to uh, announce three candidates who are running for seat number five, uh, and that is um, Dr. Cynthia Gonzalez, Nichelle Henderson, and Pat Sturgis. And they're all in the room, I take it, yes? Yes. So great. If we could just start with Dr. Hernandez, uh, excuse me, Dr. Gonzalez first. Uh, if you would give a minute and a half opening. Thank you so much. I am here as an educator and being that this is the West LA Democratic Group, I can't, I have to say that I drove to UCLA through your community 
for 19 years and I still do because I go mentor different future school leaders. Um, I have two master's degrees from UCLA in education. Uh, I have my tier one and tier two administrative credential from UCLA and my educational doctorate in educational leadership from UCLA. Because it's focused on social justice and equity, the 45 minute drive from either work, South Central to there or Southeast to there was worth it. I am here as an educator, as a longtime high school principal who works with students in South Central to make sure that they have access to higher education. I believe that I would bring a unique perspective to the board and one that understands the lives and the tribulations that our students face on a daily basis. I work with staff from different unions. I supervise teachers and instruction, but more importantly, I focus on making Second. systems work on behalf of students. So I am here to speak on the passion that I have to make sure that the community college system improves the quality of education that our students get and that students have a trustee like me, which is something they deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle. Thank you. Good evening, Democrats. My name is Michelle Henderson. I'm a lifelong Democrat and a teacher of teachers. I'm running for C5 on the Los Angeles Community College Board because it is time to address the issues of equity, diversity, and access that impact the ever-widening performance gap of Black and Brown students, which is exacerbated by COVID-19, but caused by systemic racism and chronic underfunding. My father is a graduate of LA Trade Tech College. When he attended, community college was free. I wanna see the community colleges get back to that. My vision for LACCD is to see the district be as diverse as it claims to be, starting with this board of governors. With accountability measures in place for student academic success and workforce preparation outcomes for marginalized student groups. To increase diversity in faculty and staff hires and promotion, and because budgets are a reflection of our priorities, I will work to advocate for a review of the budget and reallocation of funds to student-centered programs such as student child, such as child care for students and expanding community partnerships to provide affordable housing, food assistance, and viable healthcare options, and increase workforce, workforce opportunities and green jobs that are in line with the district sustainability plan and workforce need. Thank you. Pat. Hi. I appreciate your time and I'm happy to introduce myself and hope to earn your endorsement. I'm Pat Sturgis. I'm a high school special education teacher, a single mom and a political newbie. I'm running because community college changed my daughter Kendall's life and she said it best when she told me that community college was a constant during a time when she was uncertain about her life and her future. She's now on track to graduate from the University of Connecticut with a bachelor's degree in human development and family sciences in a credential in early childhood development and soon to have a classroom of her own. And I'm running to change the lives of others and especially during this time of global uncertainty, community colleges must be a guiding force behind our recovery and a constant for thousands of other students just like my daughter. I'm particularly passionate about special needs students. For too long, community colleges have neglected the fact that there are more than 70 seconds in the USA today with disabilities. My vision is to invest in quality transition services, and these investments will lead us into the future, for these students are most likely to be low income, homeless, and more likely to be incarcerated. And with quality transition supports, this will help to increase attendance, graduation rate, and certification. Special education programs have been cut because state and federal funding per pupil Thank you. Declined. Am I done? <laughs> you, you get to continue, but with a question this time. Okay. So Pat, um, what kind, let's continue with where you're, going, where you're going. And that is, what kind of career pathways and certifications would you put in place to assure a lifelong path to higher wage jobs for all students? Well, I think, uh, first of all, the Community College District has a great nursing program. They have a great culinary program, and they need to build more vocational programs like that. I would expand course offerings to create more vocational opportunities in partnership with local unions to train in solar, wind, and renewable energy. I mean, women can work in these fields as well as men, and I think these certifications are, are part of 
what is going to put community back seconds. into the community college. Thank you so much. Nichelle, same question. What kind of career pathways and certifications would you put in place to assure lifelong path to higher wage jobs? Well, I think that currently the LACCD has a number of um, great certification programs in place. I think what needs to happen with the district is we need to do a better job of promoting them uh, to the people that need them most. Uh, right now, we have, you know, a number of the trades unions have apprenticeship programs where they take uh, students from LACCD campuses. And uh, these programs provide great union jobs with benefits. Um, you know, the district has a sustainability plan to be carbon free by 2040. So we also need to start providing some of those certifications, LEED certifications for our buildings um, in environmental uh, sustainability. And these are programs that can be housed through the community colleges and promoted at all levels. You know, not just high school students attend community colleges. We have people that are returning, um, changing careers midlife. We have people that are formerly incarcerated, people that are dropped out of high school and, edu and a two or four year degree isn't their path. So I would like to see some of that, you know, more promotion. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Yeah, thank you. So as a high school principal, I see my students all the time who are already doing a lot of trades work, oftentimes drop out of college because they have to go work construction or plumbing or electrical. I think we have to shift the way we see community colleges to also prepare students for the trades to pre create these pathways that students are naturally doing as part of their, their homes and family work and to tell them that they can go into higher education, earn certification and participate in the union where they can get healthcare and higher paid jobs. I think that that's something that we really need to do more of. What I would do that's different that hasn't been done is just partner with different organizations. LAUSD right now, it really needs nurses. And I think we need to figure out ways in which we try to track these separate systems and try to ensure that we get the supports and alignment of um, ready employment for some of the students. And lastly, as we transition to communities of care, the mental health profession is about 80% white. If we're gonna transition our community to receive services from mental health professionals, we should start early and build those pathways so that it's our students who are being trained in mental health and who are Thank coming you. back to provide services. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have an opportunity to talk about the unique needs of students who are undocumented, homeless, disabled, transgender, and racially and religiously diverse. What will you do to address their needs? So I'll give that question to you. For me, first? Okay, perfect. So, I mean, I don't think it's just what I would do, it's what I've done. As a high school principal, I've always been at the forefront of addressing the needs of our students, from training our staff to be trauma-informed, from making sure that my school was a community school and that it addressed the basic needs of students, um, to being the first school that had a one-to-one -one iPad program for students because technology is so important. I think that we need to make sure that we have a trustee that is ahead of the game, not waiting for trends to come through to then take on some issues, but that is leading on issues that impact students across the board. You need an educator who has extensive experience in the work of what is coming and what is next. And what is coming next for our students is broadband access, not just hotspots because hotspots are inequitable. They don't service all communities the same way. We need someone who's gonna fight for broadband or for tech and for technology access, not because of COVID, but because instructional materials are an essential and inherent right for every student. That is the type of trustee that I would be and fight for and I've done at my school. Thank you, Nichelle, same question. Uh, thank you for that. Um, you know, we need to make sure that for our undocumented students that we don't think about elementary um, tactics. We need to think about the fact that these are human beings and there are limitations to what they are able to, the benefits that they're able to derive from community colleges. Um, we need to continue to pr the provisions and protections for our undocumented students under AB 540. We need to consider having um, education be a pathway to citizenship. We need to consider that although our students have certain, our undocumented and immigrant students have certain protections in place, um, many of them are not able to accept work, um, work study programs or, or 
utilize some of the benefits that our other students are able to. So we need to think about those things in terms of building community partnerships so that we can start to provide some of these services for our students that the community college can't provide Thank you. due to the restrictions of, um, of their status. Thank you. Pat, same question. Okay, well, um, I firmly believe that school resources to help children uh, should be properly funded to assist in the integration process. I think the district should be working very closely with Churla and Karasen, and there should be fair opportunities for everyone regardless of status. And I'll be a reliable voice in that area. Also, um, talking about the much wasted monies uh, going back to students. Um, I may have mentioned about the parking structures. I don't know if I did yet, but um, the district built two large parking structures for over $60 million. Instead, these monies could have been spent on creating stable, affordable, and sustainable housing for students, which would decrease carbon emissions and the necessity to commute by bus. It would be inclusive. It would increase, as I said before, the attendance rate and the graduation rate. And I think the district is sorely missing, even though it has implemented its sustainability for 2040, it should happen in 2030. Michelle, I'm going to give you the third question and everybody else follow with the same question. And that is, um, what is your plan to address student faculty safety and learning during COVID and post COVID? Thank you for that. Well, you know, we, right now the district has um, mandated that they will be virtual. All learning will be virtual through, um, I believe, through the summer this year. Um, you know, it's, it's a challenge because we don't know how long we're going to be in this particular situation of virtual learning and teaching. So in order to keep students safe, they need to be off campus right now. So right now on campuses, the only personnel are those cleaning the buildings. And once they clean a building, they move on to the next move on to the next until they're done. Um, there's no way to safely bring students back to campuses right now. And so we need to continue to provide the services that they, the access to their technology, access to textbooks and their course materials virtually for as long as we can in a sustainable way. Thank you. Pat? Thank you. Pat, can you take okay. that question? Um, I think because I'm in high school and our students are learning how to use those skills online, you will be seeing a new population coming into distance learning that are going to have some experience in this area because we're working very diligently in learning how to present lessons online to make sure that distance learning can be functional, can be rewarding, can be uh, at a high level of interest for students. Um, as far as getting seconds. back to the campus, of course, we can't get back to the campus. There would have to be tiered openings. We could consider outdoor classrooms. We could consider um, several other types of workable situations. With uh, college students, I think it's they, they'll be more uh, amenable to following protocols, although we've seen a lot that haven't but in this type of situation as far as their own learning process, thank you they'll take hold of that themselves cynthia thank you as a high school principal it is my responsibility to keep my current staff safe and i would do the same as a trustee making sure that we have the right ppe and the right systems in place to disinfect areas if we were even to consider bringing anybody back, it would have to be in a very small setting and a small, small model of adults. There would have to be rapid testing that's available so that we can ensure um, who's positive and who's negative and how we keep the students and staff safe. So definitely that. Sometimes they'll invite people to the one campus they before they come do the photo shoot. I think as a trustee, I need to guarantee that we have all of the funding and materials in place um, to disinfect. Um, in terms of student safety, when it comes to COVID, um, it's the same thing, right? Having the same protocols, giving them opportunities for rapid and massive testing, um, that needs to be done. But I also want to agree with Pat that we're in this stage where students are using new technology and are learning to teach and learn online, and that we need to think in the future of a more geared model of instruction, where because of COVID, now we maintain the 
it and make things flexible for students and staff. Cynthia, uh, you have the mic. Uh, if you could give us your one and a half minute close, you can continue from where you left off if you'd like. Thank you. Uh, well, I agree with Andrew that it's a time where we really need people with experience doing the work at the ground level. I have that experience as a high school principal. I manage budgets. I prioritize budgets. I've enacted changes at my school that are around the needs that, L that LACCD students have. And that includes basic needs. We reprioritized our school to address the basic needs of students by becoming a community school. Dual enrollment, 25% of my students currently are dual enrolled in LACCD courses. There's a lot that needs to change in the program to improve, to improve it. I have the relationships with people to be able to do that. Um, recruiting of students who are black and brown, my school 74 70% males of color. I've done the work with my students to bring their graduation rates up to make them feel like they belong in that space. I think the same needs to happen in LACCD where students feel a sense of belonging, where they understand that in every classroom they can see themselves, where they can see culture, where they can see cultural relevant curriculum. Seconds. Thank you. I have uh, the support of five of the LASD school board members, including Jackie Goldberg, Scott Schmilson, Dr. Richard Vladovic to name a few, and the support of various mayors throughout the city. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Pat, would you like to make your closing statement? Sure. I'm passionate and focused on the special education population, but I've also been an advocate for gender equality all of my adult life. I protested for women's rights in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. There can be no discrimination against special ed students nor any student based on gender identification. Both populations have been marginalized for years and have not been adequately represented with only one female trustee. We cannot reelect a trustee who has been hostile to his fellow trustees, the staff and to women. On practical policies, I would include increasing mental health services on campus I will support reappropriating police funding to counselors and trained psychological and psychiatric personnel who are capable of de-escalating situations, as well as being crucial for support services dealing with suicidal ideation. We have a climate crisis. As I stated earlier, I would expand course offerings. 30 seconds. Sure there are viable services available, so thank you. Michelle. Yes, thank you. Um, I have a 20 year career in education and in labor leadership. Um, I had bring to the table, um, I'm a former middle school teacher and I currently teach teachers at Cal State LA. I work in an online program. So I am very familiar with how to um, support the implementation of, um, of, more, of more detailed in-depth virtual learning. I have a track record of advocating for students and teachers as a faculty rights representative for my union. I'm also my union chapter's vice president. I lobby annually in Sacramento and locally for um, increased student funding, such as Prop 15. Um, I lobbied for um, the ethnic studies uh, legislation that recently passed. And what I bring most importantly is a passion for students and a passion for education. I work in classrooms every day indirectly uh, supporting new and pre-service teachers and their mentors and administrators in and around LA County. So I bring connections. I bring a, a collaborative partnership that I already have in place to support the initiatives that I hope to bring to the table of addressing the inadequacies, the inequity and the lack of diversity in the LACCD. Black students need a representative. And any plan that anyone has that does not address that plea for representation is disingenuous. It is, and it's very tone deaf. Your endorsement of my campaign will be a support for Black students, faculty, and staff across LA Community College District. Thank you. Thank you all. What a wonderful job you did. Um, if stick around uh, or stick around or tune in at around 930. We should know the results of this election. Tara. Thank you. Keep muting myself here. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, so next, we have uh, our last uh, two candidates for LACCD. Um, seat number seven, we have Mike Fong and Nancy Perlman. And I'm wondering if you are on your phones. Nancy, are you here? 
Can you I, hear me? Yes, good. I'm glad. This is Nancy Perlman. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you, Nancy. I'm just checking because we don't, you. your name doesn't come up. Mike Fong, are you here? Mike? Uh, yes, I, uh, yes, Madam President, I am here. Thank oh, you. you are here in the flesh. Okay, great. <laughs> So welcome, both of you, and um, so you each have a minute and a half to, mm -hmm. to remarks. Do you want to start, Miss Nancy? You want me to start? Yeah. Yes, okay. I, I just wanted to hear properly. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you all very much for the opportunity. I've heard some great ideas from the other trustees. And I really look forward to uh, pursuing many of those programs when I get elected. I'm an environmentalist, anthropologist, documentarian, humanitarian, feminist, and civil rights activist. I started with the Los Angeles Community College District in 1968 as a student, but I've had over 30 years working as an instructor from the 1980s through 1990s and 16 years, four terms as a trustee from 2001 to 2000. 17 and again as an instructor until of course covid i'm a classroom instructor not an online instructor which has really posed problems because the online um, programs were not available but that's a whole nother issue that uh, we can uh, discuss um, in fact uh, i'm the most qualified i have worked in the district i've been in the district i care about the district i'm not using this as a political stepping stone i am most committed to I'm committed to sustainability. I led the $9 billion sustainability program. I want sustainability in operations and academics, which my main opponent opposed that committee. I want women in office. I want diversity. I want pathways to success, oversight. I ask the tough questions. I will continue to ask the tough questions. And I believe and hope that you all will want a progressive independent Democrat who is not supported Thank by you. the faculty guild because I'm not voting the way they tell me to and that's what they want and they don't want more Jews on the board and I don't okay uh okay um Mike it's your turn to give your one and a half minutes thank you so much thank you so much uh, President Robin and good evening Democrats it's so great to see each and every one of you here today hope you're doing, doing well and staying safe and healthy in these challenging times and thank you so much to everything you're doing to mentor the next generation of leaders and to elect Democrats up and down the slate. The Los Angeles Community College District has played a big role in my life and the lives of my family. My parents met at LA City College in the summer of 66. I took a product of the LA Community College District. I took classes at East Los Angeles College and LA City College before I went to UCLA. Our education provides those opportunities for our students and our families to achieve their goals and dreams. In the last few years, we made Community College free through LA College Promise. We've co-located work source centers on our campuses. We've expanded dual enrollment programs, allowing high school students and middle school students to take community college classes for free on their respective campuses. On the Measure CC Facilities Bond Program, we're building out first-class facilities for our students. I have an open door policy. Please feel free to reach out to me anytime as well. I'm also, I'm also fighting hard for the passage of schools and communities first, which will bring an additional $40 million to the Los Angeles Community College District, and also fighting hard for the passage of Proposition 16, which will help us diversify our faculty, staff, and leadership. Thank you so much to your support in 2015 when we first ran. I'm very honored to have the support of the LA County Democratic Party, the LA County Federation of Labor, and many elected officials throughout the region. I would be honored in, to have your endorsement and support for seat number seven for the Los Angeles Community College District. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, okay. So, um, what are the graduation and transfer rates from city, uh, the, the community colleges and on? Um, we know they're not really stellar here. So give me some numbers and tell me what you will do to improve them, Mike Fong. Thank you so much, uh, President Robert, for that question. In terms of the graduation rates and completion rates and certificate rates, uh, we are uh, due to the student center funding formula. A number of our percentage of funding, 10% comes from the certificate and graduation rates. Also looking at how we continue to boost those programs. I've heard a lot of conversation on job training programs. We really did need to make sure that our programs meet the needs of industry as well and the jobs that are being presented post COVID. So really making sure that we're looking at the future of work here in Los Angeles. 
in the past few years, we've done a job training programs in welding and plumbing, the higher licks program, providing a lot of opportunities for folks in labor to partner with our district. But we need to do more on transfer rates and programs and articulation agreements with the seconds. respective uh, CSUs and UC systems. And I'll continue to fight to build out those programs and also provide more opportunities for dual enrollment to ensure that our students have the opportunity to take community college classes early on and be much better prepared when they come to our campuses. Uh, thank you. Nancy. Yes, the community colleges provide fantastic programs, both vocationally, avocationally, workforce development. And also, I worked very hard to make sure that our community college students get, could get into the California State University system. That was one of uh, my successes. Uh, I also was working very hard to try and change what is considered success in terms of graduation because certificate success, finishing workforce development programs, whether or not it was in, in culinary or, or construction, uh, those programs were not being uh, granted as part of our success in terms of graduation. So the, the data is, is not accurate. And we definitely need to provide all the support necessary for students to be able to succeed, whether or not it's textbook, costs, whether or not it's getting to colleges and free transportation, whether or not it's housing, it's, it's health care, all the needs of the students need to be provided so they can be successful and graduate. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Nancy. Um, this is a question we've asked before. Given racism, poverty, food insecurity, homelessness, and immigration policy, what programs will you put in place to ensure students' academic successes? Mike, can you address that, please? Uh, thank you so much for that question. In terms of the DACA students, we've been trying to secure more resources on DACA programs. We recently were lobbying in Sacramento in earlier part of this year, pre-COVID, to lobby for $12 million for the LA Community College District for our Dream Resource Centers. We eventually got about $6 million for our students. We need to do more around diversity, equity issues as well. We're pushing hard on those issues. We recently passed the racial equity framework at the district. And I personally have talked to the chancellor and a number of the college presidents in anticipation of the passage of Prop 16, how we can be ready to diversify our faculty, staff, and uh, leadership. Also pushing hard for Project Match, which will help diversify our faculty. We've been doing a lot of work around Project Match as well, bringing in folks who want to become adjunct faculty and diversifying our faculty, staff, and leadership. And we would love to continue to partner with you as well on these efforts uh, going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Could you repeat the question, please? Uh, yeah, just a second. It's a long one. Given racism, poverty, food insecurity, homelessness, and immigration policy, what programs would you put in place to ensure students' academic success? I was working extensively to try and provide for all of our students, provide uh, housing on some of the campuses where uh, we had the space to be able to do it, to provide the resources for the students to have the whatever uh, aids they need for doing so. Um, I know my uh, main opponent is supports dual enrollment. I taught dual enrollment, but quite frankly, you know, freshman students in high school aren't ready for college dual enrollment programs. I have that kind of experience to know what works and what doesn't because I've been on the, the lines. I'm a part-timer. I'm the only one who's worked with as, as a part-timer to get seconds. their support for part-timers to get the aid and assistance that they need to work with their students because the majority of the faculty are part-timers and the administration is not providing that support to those who are working with the students. So it's a tiered position. We have to provide resources for the students, but we have to provide resources for the teachers who are working with those students. So there are so many different areas where we have to definitely Thank take you. some of that budget. Yep. Okay, uh, you were saying, I think you were saying, take some of that budget. I you, uh, I just finished the sentence is to take the budget, 90% going to, to faculty, and take some of that money and, and give it to the students to work with the students with programs that help the students. 
Okay, well, let me lead into this then. Given this COVID economy and the loss of this tax revenue, what would your priorities be? How would you address these budget cuts uh, that you were just talking about? There are many ways to address the budget cut. Of course, we have the nine billion, you know, uh, the rest of the building program budget, and all that building program money needs to uh, many. It needs to be refocused to be able to make the classrooms and the campuses safe, so that people can return. So that's on the building program budget. In terms of the other budget, we need to refocus where we're spending the money rather than again, continuously giving more and more and more to the fact that we need to think of the students because all your questions that I've heard all night are regarding the students and we're not supporting them in the district. And I want to support them in the district. It's important that we do that. It's important that we have oversight and that we set a policy that student success and have the budget that goes along with it. Hey, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Mike, same question. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you for the question. In terms of the budget, we need to hopefully get schools and communities first pass. That'll be an extra 40 to $45 million to the Los Angeles Community College District. We need to continue to lobby our legislators on Prop 98 funds and making sure that our community colleges get our fair share in Los Angeles. Also advocating uh, to our federal government and hopefully with the Biden-Harris administration, uh, similar to Biden-Obama, Obama Biden administration that will have the opportunity to get reinvestment dollars that come to Los Angeles. We also need to continue to building out job training programs and making sure, that, making sure that our curricula meets the needs of industries that we come out of COVID. Uh, in addition, we need to continue providing resources for our students in this uh, distance learning environment. I personally work with a number of foundations and our district has raised uh, a good number of dollars to help distribute thousands of laptops for our students. At one of our recent board meetings, we also used $3 million to purchase 15,000 laptops for our students, but we need to do more for our students. And this is something that I'll continue to fight for to continue to build out more opportunities for enrollment. Thank and you. enrollment will help us address our budget. Thank you. Uh, I think it's uh, time to give us your last statements here. Closing statements, why we should vote for you, what you, anything you felt like. Uh, Mike, you want to start? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Democrats, again, and for the opportunity to join you here today. It's been a robust discussion. Uh, I always have an open door policy. Please feel free to reach out to me at any time. I want to fight for more minority business contracting. I want to fight for metro bus passes, looking at housing solutions, a safe parking programs as well, and fighting for diversity, equity, and inclusion officer and racial equity centers at our campuses, expanding project match to diversify our uh, faculty going forward as well. And very honored to have the support of Congressmember Ted Liu of Santa Maria Lena Durazo of the LA County Federation of Labor and the LA Community College Faculty Guild and the Staff Guild. And the honor, and very honored to have support of the LA County Democratic Party and a number of Democratic clubs. And we'll be honored to have the support of the West LA Democratic Club. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Nancy? Yes, I would be honored to have your endorsement and support. I believe that it's necessary to have somebody who cares about the colleges, is most qualified, most experienced, has been in the trenches. And I'd like to make a, two, uh, a couple of points. The LA County Democratic Central Committee, of which I sat on for four years, this time sent me a questionnaire after the due date. So I never even had the chance to be interviewed to have their endorsement. So I think you've got to consider that. I think you have to consider the fact that what the trustees really do. We vote on the budget. We vote on oversight. And I ask the tough questions to the point where I'm personally, not just the district, personally being sued $40 million because there was a bad construction company. And I said, no, they shouldn't be working for the district. So they're suing me individually. But I'm willing to take the risk to vote for what's right and not just vote for who... Uh, pays uh, c uh, contractors uh, who give campaign contributions and get contracts. That's not for me. I believe that the, uh, we have to set policy and the most important job that the trustees do is choosing the chancellor, choosing presidents. We need to be sure that there's diversity and women in that process. And I am viable. Yes, I don't raise tens of thousands of dollars and get hundreds of thousands of dollars for my campaign, but I won four times on a shoestring budget, on grassroots support, because people know that I represent the community, I represent the students, I Thank represent you. the staff, and I represent the faculty. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Thank you, everyone. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah, this is good. Um, I just want y'all to know that I just checked my inbox and our ballots have arrived. So um, I just want you to know that. Um, Mike and Nancy, thank you for handing out the thank you. of our questions here. And um, uh, I thank you all for coming out to our endorsement meeting and hearing from everyone. Um, you know, there's been a lot of activity in the chat and really some excellent questions for these candidates. Thank you all for, thank you guys for putting this on. I, I, there are very thoughtful questions. I wish we could just do these half hour per candidate kind of meetings and where you could get all your questions in. But I'm, I've never done this, but I'm thinking I would like to get the chat, get a control and send off those questions to these candidates. Uh, pertain to their offices and you know let them see what you're all into um so i think uh it's, it's nine o'clock um really time to adjourn if you want to but what i suggest is that you all go into your emails now and get your ballots and um vote and and if you have any problems like if you didn't get your ballot let me know so i can get to those people. And My ballot hasn't arrived, Kara. Um, Bruce, we should talk offline about that. Uh, privately in the chat. Okay. Um, My ballot arrived. This is very cool, Kara. Thank you. Right. I have to tell you, this is very exciting for me. I mean, I did this yesterday. I learned this program yesterday and I thought, Oh my God, a learning curve at this time. Okay, you know, and it was it was terrific. I, I I did the sample. I sent it around, you know, to a couple of us to see how it worked, and uh, it's working. It is working. So now we know Dallas got hers. I got mine. I got mine, and I voted. Oh my God! Guys, yeah. so, um, does somebody want to move to adjourn? Do you want to just stay? <laughs> I mean, it's oh, I've had so much fun tonight, Cara. I can't leave. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, David. Um, okay. Um, I have to go vote. I have to go. All right. Do you want a motion to adjourn? Yeah, we can go. Yes, please move to adjourn, and then we can oh. and stay if we want to stay. But the official meeting could be over. I make that well, motion. A second. Second, yeah. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Aye. I think, okay, we, we adjourn officially at 9.02, but we're staying on the Zoom, in the Zoom room. Oh, Cara, what's the last, is there a deadline to, to uh, vote? 30, the, the, uh, the ballots close. They close it. This is so amazing. I have a so I'll be back. So great, huh? That was. That was cool. That was the smoothest uh, process I've seen yet. Right? I know. I used to see you in there. Mm -hmm. Oh. Is, is everybody okay figuring it out? I really enjoyed hearing from the judges as well. Thank you all for coming. I know it's a daunting process trying to go around the county, but it was great to hear from you all. Thank you. It's it's so hard to stick to the rules about what you're allowed to say and what you're not allowed to say. You know, I know some people want to make it more confrontational, but <laughs> that's not what we want from judges, is it? We want fair and balanced, as far as I'm concerned. Alice, I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> I submitted my ballot. <laughs> awesome. Great. This is so awesome. Oh, did, did you have, did you get your ballot up? Bring me your, your. Um, Sarah Roos is saying that she doesn't have a ballot. You should. Um, you, and did you check? Bruce still doesn't have, I don't have mine either. Bruce, um, Bruce, wait, 
I looked under bulk mail too, but it's not there. Yes, you're on the phone, right? Yep, and I'm emailing you currently unless I should do something else with my vote. I'm, I'm emailing president at West LA Dems or which way? Like? So, okay, so uh, Sarah, you, you, you checked your junk mail? Sarah? Uh, Sarah's muted. Uh, unmute. Sarah, unmute. Unmute yourself. Yeah. Did you check your junk mail? She said yes in the chat. Okay, let me, okay, let me go to um, this place. Um, Sarah, put your email, please, in the... Uh, she says her audio is out. Her audio is out, okay. Yeah, hers is out. Um, Can she just chat, though? Yeah, she just, she just emailed, she just put the email address in. Okay. Let's see if I can get you another ballot. It said one notice undeliverable. Fix it. Let me just see which one. I don't know which one. It. Oh my goodness! What's going on with me again? I keep my computer just keeps going down. Kara, uh, this is Ruth Strauss. While you're doing all of that, I want to thank you for a wonderful opportunity because I've never been up on these kinds of races. So I really thank you, and I also thank your your uh, moderator, Ms. Ong. Thank you so much. Read. And I will um, I will second that, Cara. Uh, it's Greg, and I would say it was a great meeting, and uh, I thank you for keeping it uh, going very smoothly. So thank you. And on time too. That was pretty amazing. <laughs> it's a whirlwind. And third one here, Kara, this was amazing. You did an amazing job. I've been to a lot of Democratic Club endorsement meetings. They need to call you to, so you can let them know how it's done. Congratulations. And of course, I think she's away from the, um, <laughs> she didn't hear any of that. No. We'll have to put <laughs> these in the chat. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think so. I know Greg can really appreciate the. the hey, this this, this was a this is a anymore. great this is a great change. We so, can hear yeah. you, Tara. Yeah, I just my my computer's gone down. I'm now on my daughter's computer. Oh shit! Yeah. Nope, she didn't hear any of that. <laughs> what? You missed it, Tara. What happened? All oh, your kudos. Amen. Wow. Oh, come on, are you serious? <laughs> yeah. oh, great, of course I would miss that, right? <laughs> it's okay, we recorded it. You have it for your history. Oh, Sarah said she oh, found it, not. Cara. What? Cara. Sarah what? said she found her ballot. Great, oh, I'm so glad because I've been, that's when I my computer went down. When I tried to get on Election Buddy to find out, then something happened and that was tough. Chris, did you get yours? No. Okay. Just looked again and hasn't arrived oh. either. Hmm. No, Bruce, I'm, I'm trying to figure this out if I can add you at this d late time. Uh, it's very, you know, this is a, this is not easy. So while we're all waiting. Yeah. Um, you're, uh, aren't you a candidate? <laughs> yes. Somebody, uh, Nicholas, I think it was, posted a question or a comment in the chat. I wish these judges would do something about jury service and make it less cumbersome. You know, I'd love to hear from all of you um, what you think we uh, could do to make it less cumbersome, because from my perspective, the biggest problem I see is that we take far too long trying cases, that judges don't keep to the time table the way that Cara did tonight and get to the end in a reasonable amount of time. I don't think judges respect the time that jurors have. They're not free people to be you know, dealt with like commodities. We all have lives. We all have things we need to do. We'd love to do our service, but please treat us with respect and respect our time. 
I hate to see jurors standing outside courtrooms waiting for the judge to call them in for no apparent reason. Um, so that's my, my belief in, in how we can speed things up. What do you guys have to say? Well, this is Carolyn. I've had two good experiences, I'm happy to say. They, they, say, they served me, I answered, and I didn't have to go twice. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so I think the sir, I think it works great right now from my perspective. But I, I hear what you're saying about the inside, but unfortunately, it's probably only going to get worse because with COVID, the courts were shut down, yep. and they're probably cases that were going to probably be heard are all getting moved way out and might even be to next year. Uh, to the end of next year, because that's how far behind they are. Those so, cases need to be settled. We need to have a, a, a Well, they do. You know how they try to settle them? They do do. Now, one thing the courts here do, they do do a good job of uh, having almost every case always has to go to, uh, a medi to mediation. They right. do have a strong mediation process to try to eliminate... Uh, decisions coming before the, you know, before the court. But this is LA and people, this is California and people sue at the drop of a hat, unfortunately. Uh, and that is part of the problem. There are a lot of frivolous cases, a lot of them. And the judges talk about it and so do the attorneys. And that's really on the civil side, um, which I, yes. I, on the criminal side, we also have a huge backlog of cases, and, and I think those are, cases are ripe for what I'm calling the COVID discount. I, I think <laughs> everyone who's lived through this pandemic has served a sentence of sorts. I mean, if you as a judge sentence somebody to lockdown and, and, and the fear of being infected with a lethal disease, that the, the, the Supreme Court would say that's a cruel and unusual punishment. So I think those people deserve a break. I'm not saying they get away scot-free, but I think we've got to be real about it and just say moveon.com. Oh, well, the, the civil, the uh, criminal Excuse case is this. Excuse me. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, Bruce, check your email. Got it. I'm almost done voting. Okay. There's a lot of you that haven't voted yet. I, this is so amazing. I can, I can see who hasn't voting. I can't see anybody's votes, which I love. Were they online? Were the people that you see haven't voted yet? Yeah. Were they were they here? I don't know. Because I couldn't, you know, I was kind of busy. I couldn't see who was here or not. You had about sixty some people, we had but like I don't sixty three people. Yeah, but I don't know if they could all vote. You know, that's what I don't know. I can tell you like was is Kelly Willis here? He voted. He said he voted in the chat. Wait. Got his ballot, voted. Lauren Renee, I don't know if you're here. Um, Nikki, are you, are you here? No. Okay, look, I'm just, I'm, I'm going to tell you all who. Um, Ingrid, um, Ingrid from Law Pack. Are you here? I didn't see her. No. She, uh, okay, so, um, Either, but did she she probably registered so that yeah. she would be able to uh i don't know if jane Wishon is still here she uh, hasn't voted yet nope and cynthia hart hasn't voted what's the deadline for voting what time 9 30 so we still have time um stephanie nordlinger you got your ballot vote <laughs> Stephanie, come on, vote. Sarah, it said you got your ballot, Sarah. You haven't voted yet. This is so awesome. Plus, we won't have to count them. I'm assuming it will automatically tally. Yes. And we even get a receipt. Ballot submitted. Mark. Mark Salzburg. Did you vote? Says you haven't voted yet. When do you plan to give the results, uh, Cara? Well, they have to wait till all the ballots come in. 
and I, I have it shut off at 930 so that everyone can vote, you know, because of things that could go wrong. Like, right. It just went wrong. Yes, so, this is, the, this is, the, this is the same system Santa Monica uses. And they told us right away after he closed the election, you know, after he closed the time, then yeah, he after, posted the results. After he closed it. Yeah. But I, I, I'm closing mine at 930. Yeah. I heard you. Thank you. Yeah. So as soon as uh, we hear, we'll, we'll tell you. All right. Did you say that Sarah Roos didn't vote? She's asking. Let me see. I thought I heard that she received a ballot, but I didn't hear whether she voted. Exactly. I'm looking. I, I thought it had not voted. She got her ballot. You got I, don't know no, I have to. Uh, when I have to refresh because Bruce said he had voted. But they've got him not voted yet. No, I, I got the receipt for having voted now. Okay, good. That was at 910. So, okay. I let Ingrid Palmer know that she should have gotten a ballot. She said she's looking for it now. Perfect. Yeah, well, she had typed her, she typed in her uh, email wrong. I don't know how that happened. I mean, I, because it. So, you don't think it went to her or? No, I just corrected. I corrected the typing. I hope it was the right correction because I don't know how do you type your. I don't. It should. It was. It was Law Pack Programs. P R O G R E M S at Gmail. So I that's thought, that's I thought, correct. Yeah, it is Grams, not Grams. It's not Pro Grams. Yeah, with a right. Yes. Like program, yeah. Well, she, she said it, it came up E instead yeah, of A. It came up e, so I figured um, maybe it was just like a typo. So I put in the A. So now she should get it. Okay. It says not voted before it was not delivered. So. Her. Yeah. Uh, I've made you as Miranda uh, host again. Thank you. I'm back though. I'm me. Oh. Oh, I'm on her. I'm on Miranda's. <laughs> You're Good Miranda. job, Mark. Good job, Mark. Good job, Mark. You're on it. Well, I have to run. Okay. So okay. You're in charge. <laughs> Mark, did you vote? It says you haven't voted. I voted. I've got a a receipt okay. on my screen that said it was submitted. Okay, great. I have okay. to refresh. Okay, bye bye. I thank you for helping out, Mark. Okay, I'm back. Right? Good to see you, Mark. See you guys. See ya. Bye -bye. So I'm, I'm back as, now I'm back as West LA. Whoops, I better want to take this down. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, so I'm back. I left two voicemails for Jane Wishon. Oh, no. Okay. I can text her. <laughs> Car, you've got to put Miranda on mute. She does. She no, is on mute. No, you, she's well, still are on. You, we're we're getting, getting an echo from you. Um, uh, it's like really dreamy, man. <laughs> uh, Sarah Ruth said she got a receipt, so she's fine. All right, so this is good. I think that, I think it's going along. Now I just want to see what the... Uh, I can get the results. Let's see, because you know I they know everybody who they know everybody who's voting. So I think they wait until all the ballots, unless I can just close it. But I'm not going to close it because you gave until nine thirty. Nine thirty. Yeah, you can't you can't close it before nine thirty because you told people. You know me. I'm just it's only twelve minutes away. Look at goody two shoes. Where's Joan? Why did it Joan vote? So, well, Elena, it's so good to see that you. We're waiting for? What? Is it only 10 votes that we're waiting for? Why do you say that? Is that I'm just making up a number. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no. I, there's, there were like, there was something like, I don't know, 78 people or something that they didn't all come, but you know that were members that signed in. 
But the high point of the call was 63 and we had about 15 candidates. So yeah, looking for a response rate of about 45 to 50. You still do 60%, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It'll tell you that too. Yep. Yeah, uh, the problem with them, we have what, 11 minutes now. Um, the problem with them is they do plurality. You know, and we don't do plurality because we have, um, we have, yeah, you know, but they give you percentages so you can figure it out <laughs> pretty easily. Yeah, so, it, this is what Santa Monica uses. It's, it's really good. It's yeah, so quick. It's I love it. And um, the thing is, they would declare a winner, you know, like they would say if somebody got 35% and the other got 45% um, or... Yeah, they'd say one, the, they, top, the top person won, right. Uh -huh. yeah. But it's not 60%, right. That's why I couldn't, why I didn't want everyone to just go see the results and figure out somebody won when they really didn't get our endorsement. They might have won the plurality. Well, let me just see how it's going here. One minute. So, okay, so next uh, on, the, on the 1st, on October 1st, we're gonna have a propositions meeting. Um, Dave Dayan is gonna be our moderator and he's been great. And you know, last time we had the propositions meeting, which I think was two years ago, I'm pretty sure, and we were at the Peace Center and we got our picture, uh, first of all, it was online, our, our picture, and then it was on the back page of the LA Times. Yeah, I remember that, I remember that. Awesome. It was for the uh, public bank. It was because of the public bank. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Right. That was really quite wonderful. So Dave will be our moderator again. We are going to debate five propositions with pro and con speakers there. And then Dave will do the rest and he'll give us updates. And it'll be a pretty substantive meeting. I think we can spend a little more time on it. That's all we'll do is the propositions so that we can actually have some things coming from the uh, Dallas. Yes, I'm 15 and 16, not so fast. <laughs> we don't know, we're gonna have a debate, right? But I am totally yes on 15. I'm even, I'm even voting yes on things that aren't even in my interest as a landlord. Can you imagine that? Because I'm not a gouger. So I think rent controls are okay. Um, You're an informed Democrat. I'm an informed Democrat. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, let me check again, see what's going on with this. Yeah, so I'm excited about this, this props meeting. Um, you know, and you know that we are very much involved with the uh, Westside Democratic headquarters, so which is we're doing all of our election work out of there. And... Um, we just need everybody to get on the phones or text or write posts. Oh, every day, every day now. Uh, if everybody just did an hour. Totally. No, oh, I mean, and the texting. Oh, my God. You could, you could spend four hours texting different states, you know, and, and text and do like 4,000 texts or something. It's insane. It is really insane. You uh, know what I just found out? Cummins wants to know where do we get postcards to send? Oh, it's too late to send postcards now. It's time to be calling and texting. Carolyn, Carolyn, I am vice chair of our headquarters. <laughs> I'm just telling you what was said on the DNC call today. <laughs> no, anyway, right? Anyway, we still I just saw somebody's social media where they had a stack of postcards that they were mailing, yeah. Yeah. filling in and mailing today. So yeah, they some said of them are still going. Yeah, no, they said do it. They've been we've been writing them for a long, long, long time and keeping them, you know, and then sending them off, sending them off at the proper time. Yeah, so that that really works. Uh, but we still are doing postcards, and you know, we still can do some like of our local of our house seats that we flip, we still have to save those, you know, wouldn't it be like disaster if we lost the house? That's Carolyn, I have a question. 
Yeah. Um, in terms of what they said on the DNC call, I heard that uh, they did a poll of Asian Americans throughout America, and uh, many of them are reluctant to go out of the house to vote. Uh, they're just concerned about Asian Pacific Islander hate, and they're concerned about COVID and this, that, and the other. But they're going to be a higher propensity uh, vote by mail people. And so I was wondering whether or not we can actually do some text banking to just remind people to turn in their ballot by mail, which is different than a persuasion call, for example. You know, Elena? Yeah. Hi. Nice to see you guys. I just, I've been listening and then, you know, couldn't resist hopping on the after party call. <laughs> um, are you sure? Because I'm wondering how to talk to my Movi list about whether it's better to mail, which is what we recommended for March 3rd, vote by mail. But I'm thinking drop boxes may be better or walking your ballot into your precinct, walking your paper ballot into your precinct. Do you have any thought about whether or not we should be advocating folks to drop in the mail? Um, I can tell you that the thought process is that when you get your sample ballot, first of all, it's make sure you're registered to vote. I should have put that in the chat. Yeah, I will, check, I will check vote. Your registration is the number Make one sure you register to vote. Make a plan to vote. Um, when you get your sample ballot, figure out how you want to vote so that when you get your ballot, you can do that very easily. Mark your ballot, sign it, make sure you sign it on the back, and mail it right away if you're going to mail it or drop it off. There's going to be places where you can drop it drive through or take it into the uh, center. But it, they're fine with the mailing as long as you mail it the first week for sure. And because the other thing about that mailing it right away, those votes will be counted on election night because they will have had them, had time to process them and run them through. That's a very uh, important message. I totally appreciate that, Carolyn. What about the fact that our voters are so uneducated about the propositions? Is there any strategy to educate folks about the props and judges? Because that slows people down. Yeah, I know. That's why they're saying get your sample ballot. Uh, the hard part about that is this. Many of the clubs are taking on, I know um, from the Election Protection Committee, we're, we're, we're presenting di to different clubs that whole voting process. Uh, but your question about uh, How are we going to vote? educate our voters about the props? Yeah, about, well, here's the thing. How do you reach uh, 5 million voters <laughs> in 40 some days about that? So, <laughs> People are going to be counting well, on. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I tried to do that because I ran a ballot measure. Obviously, I had to figure that out. Um, and you've got to start. Well, you know, we have the there's going to be do slates. It, you know, mm -hmm. people mail slates. You know that. Yeah. Uh, uh, whether it's what we, how we want them to vote or not. But, you know, the party <laughs> has their position they've taken. And uh, I know it's on LACDP. Well, not yet, because we have a meeting on the 22nd about LACDP and the props. But the state party has taken a position on all the props. So a lot of people are telling us. we do a whole slate like two weeks ago or whatever? Last week, the interminable meeting? Didn't we do the props then? I admit We were I up till 3 in the morning. Up. We were up till 3 in the morning. I fell asleep at one forty, so I missed. No, we did not do the propositions. At okay. three at 3.30, okay. we still had not done okay. the proposition, okay. and that will be on the 22nd that we're doing. Yeah, so maybe we can, as LACDP, and I know I'm off topic a little bit because this is a West LA Dem club meeting, but figure out a way to mail to the entire voter roll and email everybody. Uh, I can share with you, they can't afford to do that. Okay. <laughs> but we can email everybody we've got who's a Democrat, uh, we right? We can email, we can text. And tell them to spread it. All right, yeah, all right. There needs to be a real good LACDP thing, because the, obviously the 
propositions are so important. I really worry about getting lost in the sauce. Yeah. Um, oh. and we, and we, didn't, the they, other, didn't they the um, institute the more message. drive up ballot drops? Because I, frankly, I'm not trusting the mail with my jealous. ballot. <laughs> And uh, I know my mom, I don't know if you said that or not, but I, I mean, my go-to, my go-to recommendation would be to fill your ballot and, and just drop it at the polling place, if possible. Oh and yeah. it's so much faster because you don't have to wait in line. You can just go in and drop it as opposed to waiting in the line with people. Well, you, we still have COVID and some people are still a little nervous about that. You have to respect that. But right. they can have someone else, as long as they've signed it, they can have someone. Right. Uh, I would recommend getting into the harvesting thing, though. I like Dallas's idea. And Dallas, yep. I also really like the drop boxes, but we did have a few instances, most notoriously at UCLA, where a drop box was carted off. Um, yeah. So, Whoa. Oh my God. <laughs> so we want to make sure that those are really secure but that now would the gop stoop to something like that they sure yeah, would they <laughs> i think unfortunately in this county some down. of our dems have <laughs> right i'm part of an election right. integrity excuse me i'm part of an election integrity uh group both nationally and locally and yes it is possible for them to put up a uh, decoy yeah uh, boxes etc i yeah. agree with yeah yeah People should, you know, either drive their votes in or actually, if you can go and drop them yourself to make sure that there's no challenge of your um, signature or anything. Are just I think it behooves us to put a list together. I'm it's 9.30. Sorry, I know. You should wait until night. it's 9.31. I don't know what's happening because... I have been trying to talk now for three minutes and everyone just talks over me. And can you not hear me? Do I have to shout? No, I couldn't yeah. hear you. I couldn't hear you. Talking and talking and I'm like, gee, I've already had the ballot. I've already had the results and you're just talking away. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, so in the meantime, I started writing a constant contact. Um, so I will tell you what um, the results are. So I will give you the percentages, all right? Uh, Judge of the Superior Court, seat 72. Mayanna Dellinger got 39%. Steve Morgan got 61%. So Steve wins our endorsement. Uh, seat number 80, David Berger. Uh, Ber How do you say it again, David? Berger. 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 Oh, like Berger. Merger. No. Is that a non corporate merger? Okay, come on. What is the percentage? 73.8%. <laughs> uh, oh, wonderful. So, congratulations, David. What was it? That's awesome. 3.8%. 73. Very nice. Uh, David Diamond, Scott uh, Yang. David got 45%. Scott got 55%. So, no endorsement. No consensus. No endorsement. Well, yes. no endorsement. Yeah. No endorsement. This is an endorsement meeting. We're oh, okay. Endorsement, Carol. <laughs> it, it just sounds so bad. It may, it sounds like nobody was qualified. That's why I always do that. But okay, go on. Way, there is another thing that people do when say no endorsement if somebody does not want the club to take a position. You know, if you don't want the club to take a position, then you vote no endorsement. But if you vote no, if you abstain, then it doesn't count. It's not no consensus. It, is, it really is no. But we, we don't endorse in this race. That's what's happening. Um, but there's no no endorsement choice independent no. of those others. No, I didn't do that because last time that's what just it was like. I don't even know why people would do no endorsement. Um, Onward with the totals. Thank you. <laughs> So you're very lucky you got to vote, by the way. I, we have to go offline with this. Um, Holly Mitchell, 100% of the vote. Uh, Andrew Hoffman, 100% of the vote. Um, no, there's no endorsement in seat three. Uh, and Dana got 45.2%. Vela got 
0.8%. Uh, trustee five, uh, no endorsement. Uh, Cynthia Gonzalez, 34.9%. Michelle Henderson, 55.8%. Pat Sturgis, 9.3%. So no endorsement. What was, what was the Pat Sturgis? 9.3%. Uh, and then District 7, uh, Mike Fong got 43.9%, Nancy Perlman 56.1%, no endorsement. So there you go. So we invest in two races, uh, well, in four races, actually. Four races, yeah. Two unopposed, and then Steve and David. Congratulations. I am delighted. Thank you all so much for your vote of confidence in me. Uh, Kari, you, you ran a fabulous meeting. I'm going to shut up now before I say something silly. No, that's <laughs> we'll all take next team. No, great no. job, Kara. I'm yeah. on. Great job, Kara. Thank uh, you, thank you, Kara. Great job, thank you, West LA Democrats. Very appreciative. Thank uh, you. Congratulations, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Thank you. Okay. Congrats, Andra. Great job, Kara. Thank you. Thank no. you, everyone. Thank you all. Have a great evening and don't forget to vote on November 3rd. Yes, absolutely. Please. Well, well let's, let's all get out there and do some work, though. I mean, really, you guys, you have to do some work. This is, mm -hmm. this is insane, you know. Oh, also, one more thing for those of you who are still on, just to let you know, uh, mark your ballot, not your ballots, mark, mark your calendars for noon, October 11th. I am part of this amazing, very small team of six people, and we are putting on a fundraiser for five of the uh, flippable seats uh, in the Senate, and it's called Senate 180. Let's turn it around, you know, spin that Senate around. It's kind of my title here, and uh, it's going to be awesome. Our, we're going to do a Zoom call for an hour, hour and a half. Um, our hosts are Viola Davis and Amy Brenneman. Wow. Andra, um, Andra Day, is that her name? Yeah. I love Andra Day. Yeah, she's amazing. Rise wow. Rise Up. She is our musical number. And we'll have the five uh, senators. And we're having um, MJ Hager, Teresa Greenfield, um, John Ossoff, Jimmy Harrison, and... Oh, Cal Cunningham, of course. You know, and Viola Davis is really is from North Carolina, so she does a lot of campaigning for Cal. It's going to be awesome. And then we're going to have like a, a pre-show, like the, like the VIP room. And um, we're going to have Steve Martin's, you know, his bluegrass band from North Carolina playing. And we're going to have a, I, I mean, there's so much going on. Langston Hughes poem. We have, I think, 60 actors in the regular show uh, doing an opening an opening poem that we've written and then the uh, closing poem is this Langston Hughes America is what what is it America is America was is not America for me or something it's all about how America was based on this thing for everyone but point of fact is it was never for everyone and um, Anyway, it's going to be such an awesome show. I can't even stand it. And we are committed to raising a half a million dollars, 100,000 uh, for each candidate. And tickets start at 250, but you know me, West LA Dem Club members in good standing, I always get a little thing for, and I'm hoping, I'm trying to talk us into, and since I'm one of the six on this committee, to have our members come for $100 rather than $250. And so that's going to be great. So just let you know, October 11th, mark your calendars noon. I'm going to be doing this every day. <laughs> that's it. I'm going to say good night because I'm really hungry. And congratulations, you all who are here. I'm sorry we didn't get endorsements for the other candidates. Um, we do 60% because it seems to be a better thing than just a plurality. So thank you and um, good night. Good night, everyone. Bye. Good night. Bye, Andrew. Bye, Elena and everyone.